them at the end of the day and push people down the stairs. So my name's Andrew Hay. Uh, if you saw me speak yesterday, you're going to hear a lot of the same jokes because I have a very small repertoire. Uh, give you a little bit of an idea about me. Uh, I am the Chief Information Security Officer at Data Gravity. Been there since January. Before that, I was the Director of Research at OpenDNS, which is why if you were in Taz's talk, she kept looking at me and I would do this or do this. When some of the things she was talking about for DNS. Uh, so I built that team. Really fun. I was the Chief Evangelist and Director of Research at Cloud Passage uh, for a while. I was also a dirty industry analyst for a number of years. Uh, I worked as a practitioner doing a lot of incident response, forensics, uh, and general information security office type stuff at the University of Lethbridge in Western Canada. I'm sure you've never heard of it. It's about an hour north of the Montana border, so really in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I also worked in the information security office for a bank in Bermuda. I'm not going to tell you which one, but there's only three. so. And a one in three shot. It sounds a lot cooler than it actually was. I also worked at Q1 Labs, which is now IBM. I think it was employee 34 or something. And I've written a whole bunch of books that, looking at my statements, none of you have read. Um, I'm assuming you all were in that session yesterday because none of you laughed at that. I blog sometimes. I spend a lot of time on planes going from conference to conference. I think this is my my 18th or 20th conference this year, and I've still got as many to fill out the rest of the year, which my wife is very happy about. So what we're going to talk about, so first, why me? Uh, I've managed engineers, I've managed researchers, security analysts, a whole bunch of different companies. Uh, I am a self-taught data scientist in that I have no scientific background. Uh, and our Ruby and Python hacker, and I use the term hacker with the air quotes because I'm not a hacker in the sense of I really understand these languages and can rip them apart. I just kind of piecemeal things together until they do work. They look pretty horrible. If you go to my Git repo, you'll look at that and say, wow, how does this even work? Because uh, I'm generally as surprised that it works as you might be. So. I, some of the research I'm kind of known for, which isn't that great a thing. Uh, I did a lot of the initial research on the IoT Hello Barbie. Uh, I actually had someone come up to me at RSA and like, hey, hey, you're the, you're the Hello Barbie guy, which is, you know, that's what you want to be known as. It's like, oh, you're the, it's like, no, you're the guy that hacked the car. No, you hacked Hello Barbie. Great. A uh, whole bunch of bogus website research presented on a lot of graph theory and um, malware analysis at Black Hat. It's been fun. So I've, I've been a practitioner. I've managed, managed teams of researchers. I've also hired a lot of people that are new to the research game, either right from academia or from the security just side of the planet. And these are a lot of tips and tricks and methodologies that I've developed to help people start a research project. Because that's probably the number one thing that I'm asked is, what do I research? And this is from employees who I've hired to be researchers. Like, dude, you're the researcher. You tell me, what do you want to research? Um, stuff on the internet? Malware? Like, that's a broad category. I didn't even say that's a, a category. So I use this model. Not to insult anyone, but just to really put in your head the different types of research that is out there. And I use this a little bit. This is, this is much better. So there is pure knowledge type of research where you're doing it for the spirit. This is highly academic, uh, not very applicable. Whereas bottom right hand, you know, Thomas Edison has a ton of patents has built a ton of physical devices. And I put Deve on here as well because, so if anyone doesn't know who Deve is, he does a lot of lock picking. Uh, he's written a couple books. And if he builds tools, it's not to make the locks and the lock companies better, but rather 
to show how to exploit it in a quick and dirty fashion. So it's not for the betterment of humanity, it's for tackling a particular objective. So I would say that the hybrid of this is the user-inspired base, basic research, and that's where I put Charlie and, and Chris in for the car hacking stuff. Because it wasn't, hey, we're going to do some really cool stuff and that's it. It's, we're going to do some stuff to raise awareness and hopefully change the way people develop and implement technology in cars. And I'd say they've done a pretty good job of that. So I use, this is a, a graphic for, if you look up what a data scientist is, these on the left, I know it's kind of hard to read, uh, but under math and statistics, we've got things like machine learning, uh, statistical modeling, experiment design, Bayesian inference. If you're a math or a science nerd, you may say, oh yeah, that's me, that's totally me. I am crap at math, so that is not me. Uh, domain knowledge and soft skills, this is where I shine, where I have the knowledge of the attacker, of the threat, of the device, and I can communicate it in either a written fashion or a presentation, eh? or online, you know, just some sort of publication. Programming and database, I already told you I'm a crap programmer, uh, but definitely key components if you want to do some research. Now, I will say that you may not have all of these. It's probably a safe bet. Does anyone here not have any of these, by the way? Yeah, so someone, does anyone have all four? Oh, no one's arrogant. To, oh, one is arrogant to say that he has all four. Good for you, sir. Uh, communication and visualization, that's another one that's very important, how to communicate your, your findings to someone who, or someones who don't really care about the, you know, the numbers and the knobs and the degree of twist in the knob to get a certain result. They want to see the pretty pictures, they want to see the findings, they want to see what made it tick, or they want to see the sausage without seeing how it was made. Which, you know, it's an important skill. Um, I will say that infographics are kind of like the knock-knock joke. Infographics are similar to knock-knock jokes in that they're the lowest form of communication uh, for a joke. Uh, infographics definitely fall into that category. They're very marketing. They're good at very big picture stuff, but not, you know, succinct information. So this is for a data scientist. When I, at, when I looked at this, I said, okay, there's a few things that are missing for a security researcher. And that's curiosity, event action driven. So if you work for an organization as a security researcher, you will get things pop up like the release of Hello Barbie. Like, hey, that thing connects to the internet. I need to research that. That's an event driven. So product release drove us to research that. Uh, go to market time sensitivity. If you're competing with fellow researchers at different firms or just in general in the community, there is an artificial timeline imposed. You need to be the first. So it's, it's the old Ricky Bobby thing. You're either first or you're last. And then security researchers tend to have a need to do good or bad. I won't be arrogant enough to say that all security research is performed by people that are good, bad guys and girls, do research as well. The difference is that, from what I've seen, is that the need to do good, so the researchers that are doing good, are trying to release something for either the betterment of society or the betterment of their company, their standing within the community, uh, whereas the bad guys, it's more of a means to an end and you're not going to get people posting, you know, O days before they've ever been used. Like, yeah, no, I want to share this with the community because I'm a bad guy. This is what I use to crack into these banks. Now you can too. That You're not going to see that unless it's much farther down the road and they've lost all utility for that exploit. Now some of the pros and cons. Now you might say, okay, I still don't know what to research, Andrew, uh, but we're getting there. There's types of research and pros and cons to each. So if you do net new research, 
you have full control over the experiment. You get to define the parameters because it's, you know, it's your baby. Uh, you also have the potential to be first. If no one else is researching this, which it does happen, sometimes you're researching something that no one else has thought to research. The cons, though, it's very time consuming because you're starting everything from scratch, from the ground up. There's also that time sensitivity, and time is a big factor in all of these, uh, more so in brand new research. Because the longer it takes you to complete your research, the more likely that someone else is going to pick up research in parallel, in direct competition with you. Continued research is actually kind of fun because someone else has done a lot of the legwork for you, so that's, that's very positive. So they may have data sets already generated, they have theories that uh, may have been posed but were never actually executed or carried through the research cycle, which you can pick up and now you have a little piece of this research. That could be your claim to fame or, or your contribution to this ongoing research. Uh, the downsides of continued research, has anyone, so who here does research in some capacity? All right, who here that does research has ever tried to pick up someone else's research and they will not give you any information? Yeah, it's like, oh, well, you know, these are my findings. Uh, you can't have them. You know, this, this is IP. This is proprietary to my university or to my company. That makes it very hard to pick off where someone else left off because really you're continuing that research using a lot of assumptions if they weren't outlined specifically in the research paper or the way it was communicated. So you're, you're doing a lot of guesswork. So that way that person can challenge your findings or anyone can challenge your findings because you can't say one-to-one -one that the data sets are identical because you don't have what the other person used. Uh, challenging research, this does not mean calling someone out on Twitter. Uh, a lot of people think that's how you challenge research by pointing and saying that's stupid or that's wrong. That's really, so don't do that, stop doing that. What would your mother think? Uh, the benefit though is if you challenge someone's research, the time constraint isn't as sensitive. So time is not as sensitive uh, and you can really take your time to prove or disprove the findings. The cons, however, it can be very time consuming. And a time consuming piece of this is if you point at someone and say, your findings are stupid and you're an idiot. Hey, by the way, can you share that data with me so I can disprove what you found? They are probably not going to help you make them look even more stupid than you already think they are. So, you know, approach it with kid gloves if you want to challenge someone's research. Uh, the cons, you know, it could, you could validate their findings. You may have spent a whole bunch of time trying to disprove the findings only to come to the exact same conclusions, which is good for the other person, not so good for you because you're not releasing anything new, no new findings, uh, no challenging thoughts. It's hard to really do a presentation, say, here is everything that I didn't find wrong with this, this research on this exploit or on this tool. No one cares. They want to find out what you found was wrong or what was new, not that everything's cool. What are we going to do for the next 58 minutes? Any questions? Like that's, that's boring. That's not a talk that you're going to want to go to. So not everyone should be a researcher. And you should always use these three questions to decide if you should research something. The first one being, what's the question you're trying to answer? In the case of the Hello Barbie stuff, uh, myself and Andrew Blach, which was really confusing for the media because our first names are both Andrew, uh, we wanted to know how vulnerable or how insecure or how how privacy uh, can be exploited by using Hello Barbie because it's connected to the internet. And we had concerns, neither of us have kids, but we had concerns that someone 
could eavesdrop on communications, could use the Barbie, use Barbie for bad things. So did we, ha do you have the data an to answer the question? In the case of Hello Barbie, I spent two to three hours surfing the internet looking for Barbie related information, which as I said, I don't have kids. So if someone was looking at those proxy logs, I, I probably look like a predator, but I swear it was for research. If you're going to research something like Hello Barbie, don't like then start saying windowless vans or bulk candy orders. You don't want to stitch together that timeline for someone to look at. Or maybe you do. Maybe that's your research. So three, so do you have the data to answer the question? Yes, we bought the device and we could generate the data we needed to conduct the research. So if you could answer the question, could you use the answer? So could you use the answer? Could society use the answer? Could the vendor that released the product use the answer? That's the you in that. So in our case, if we could answer the question, could we use the answer? Yes, we could responsibly disclose to the vendor, which we did. We could let the media know about the challenges and the issues around these fast releasing IoT devices, specifically for children as we're leading up to the holidays. You know, these are things that we wanted to make known. Now I won't go through all of these and the slides will be posted. So there's a number of questions or types of questions that you can ask. When we're doing security research, the most common are the exploratory and inferential. So exploratory, I've got a data set, I'm going to see what I can find in this data set. Uh, versus inferential, it's like, I believe that uh, that communications between point A and point B are insecure uh, based on the company's past track record. So you're inferring a result before, or you're, you're really asking a question of the, the target of your research. The others are very loosey-goosey. Ignore those ones. So now, how do we analyze the data? So this is a continuous motion. So you have to first set the expectations of, all right, I believe, so this isn't really how the research went, but so I believe that Hello Barbie communicates to the server hosted in Amazon uh, using insecure protocols, which it did. Uh, but let's just say, you know, doesn't use SSL. Collects data, the communications between the app and between Barbie and the internet. Uh, we see that, hey, you know what, it does use SSL. It may be a vulnerable, vulnerable cipher strength or suite, but, uh, you know, so that kind of challenges our first question. So if you go to the next one, we need to revise the expectations and feed it back into the expectation setting phase of, okay, even though it does use SSL, does it use insecure cipher suites? And then we just keep going until we can really form a hypothesis for our research. I'll tell you, there's nothing worse than posing a very broad, vague question uh, and then getting to the end of your research and finding like, ah, oh, crap, that wasn't good. That, was, that wasn't a good research project at all because I, you know, there's too many different ways I could take it and I, I didn't refine it down as much as I could. So if you are going to perform research, you should have a question, because if you don't have a question about something, then you're not, why research something? Uh, you should have a curiosity. So if you are not curious how a device works or how an application works or how the target of your research is interesting or how it operates, you're probably not going to have much of a personal attachment to your research. And if you don't have an attachment to your research, that's kind of like someone giving you a whole bunch of homework and say, hey, you know what, I know you don't care about this, but you should do this. You're like, no, I'm not going to do that. It means nothing to me. I don't care. So it'll just drag on. Now time, time, how many people here are married? So that's a lot of people. So you have, how many people have kids? So you have ample time to do whatever you want. 
lots of free time for research. My advice to you, so I have two dogs and I'm married, not to the dogs, uh, to a wife. But time became a challenge. But you know how I carved out time, and this is how I suggest you do it, is find a television show that your significant other loves that you cannot stand. For me, Dancing with the Stars. I would rather shove so many forks in my eye than sit there and watch Dancing with the Stars. On the plus side, it gives me an hour to two hours a week to do research. In that time over the years, I've learned Python, I've learned Ruby, I've learned R, I've learned data science, I did Hello Barbie research, I've done a whole bunch of other research, I've built tools. Uh, you know, thank you Dancing with the Stars for giving me research time with your stupid show. So find a show that you hate. Bachelor is probably another good one. My wife doesn't watch that, but if she did, I'd, you know, I'd gain more hours a week. So the ability to execute. This is key. You can have a, an awesome idea for a research project, but if you have neither the time, the curiosity, or the technical skills to execute on that research, that becomes a challenge. So I forced myself to learn Ruby, R, and Python because I needed to create tools that weren't there and analyze the data in a repeatable fashion. Uh, I'm a very bad programmer. You know, I wouldn't consider myself a programmer. I am far better at foosball, which I would say that I majored in in college before I dropped out, uh, because I couldn't envision myself sitting behind a keyboard coding for the rest of my life. That just wasn't me. Look at me now. So I dropped out and I didn't want to do that anymore. We'll talk about some of the different areas of research in the next few slides, but you need to be able to execute on one or some or all of the different areas in order to provide some sort of research. Maybe you're great at graphics. So I realize that that's not something that I expressly outlined in um, the areas to execute, but the ability to communicate your research is fantastic. You know, that's not a skill that everyone has. Taz was a good example. When she was up here presenting, she was presenting things that her team did. But the shared collective, she has the ability to present it to people. Granted, she does her own research and is focused, hyper-focused on some of her own things, but the ability to present someone else's research, that's a skill that not a lot of people have. And then the last one is the asset device software. I usually just group this into asset or device. So if you're going to research software, have the software. If you're going to research a device, buy the device or borrow the device. We'll get to that in a little bit here too. So device acquisition or asset acquisition. You can fork out money uh, and buy something, electronic software toys. You can borrow it from work from a friend, from a neighbor. You can quote unquote rent it and return it from an electronic store, rent a center, do you guys have Rent-A-Center up here? They have a lot of stuff that you can just rent for a week, do some research and return it. No questions asked. Uh, you can download. So for any software, you can get trial, VMs. If it's a SaaS application, it's going to be there anyway. You can get a 30-day, 90-day trial. Poke and prod at it a bit. So my, these are some of my favorite places to rent equipment and software. Costco. I love going to Costco. Uh, I just hate waiting in lines at Costco. But they have a full refund policy on everything. You know, it can be on fire and melted as you bring it back to them, and they'll be like, yeah, well, we'll give you a credit, or we can exchange it. So you have to return it within 90 days, and this includes televisions, projectors, computers, cameras, camcorders, tablets, iPods, MP3 players, which we all buy a lot of these days, and cell phones. I assume that means the... Uh, the pay-as-you-go phones, not the ones on the long-term plans. Target, another good one. Um, if it's a Target-branded item, you know what, if you can't think of a research project, do research just on Target-branded items that they resell or they package, because you can return it up to a year later, even if it's unpackaged. Uh, unopened in new condition, so non-Target stuff, 90 days. 
Uh, no contract cell phones, computers, cameras, gaming systems, 30 days. Music, movies, video games, because everyone responsibly purchases them and doesn't download them illegally from the internet, uh, that have not been opened, can't be returned. But you can exchange it. So if you want to focus on the latest, greatest games or software or um, you know, some of the software that's embedded in DVDs or Blu-rays, you have a continuous loop. You're just like, yeah, I'm gonna, oh, I didn't like this. I'm going to return it. Oh, I didn't like this one either. I'm going to return it. Eventually, someone's going to catch on, but then you just move to a different store until you get onto a list, and then you start borrowing or enlisting your friends. I had my researchers at OpenDNS buy stuff online so that it didn't look like I was hoarding a whole bunch of stuff. Because the last thing I wanted is like, hey, let's do research on on pressure cookers. No, no, we probably shouldn't do that. And I'm not going to buy 10 of them from one site at one time. That's And fertilizer. We're going to get a whole bunch of fertilizer, too. Fries. I don't know if you guys have fries here, but if you're in Vegas, go to fries. Uh, we've got a bunch of them on the West Coast. I think there's some on the East Coast, too. But I'm like a kidney candy store walking through there. It's every piece of electronics, uh, making, building, destroying equipment, plus They've got a huge, absolutely huge aisle that's filled with connected toys, uh, like kids' toys. So one day, my wife, I told her that, oh, I'm going to go to Fry's, just pick up some stuff for research. And I'm like dancing down the aisle with a cart and picking all of these toys. Again, if I went out into a windowless van, someone would have called the cops. But I, I had all of these things that I could test and then return. And there's a lot of obscure stuff that you can't get at Costco or Best Buy or anything like that. Like a lot of knockoff Chinese brands that no one's heard of uh, that are just resold or repackaged. Like, oh, all right, well, I'll test that and then return it. So $250 later, I had a whole bunch of stuff to test. A whole bunch of webcams that no one's ever heard of. Uh, Best Buy, they have a lot of really good new products. Uh, especially when it comes to you know, physical pieces of technology. Uh, I would advise that you don't try and you know, rent a television before a big sporting event. They, that's not great. Um, they will typically push you, like if you're going to get a whole bunch of stuff on Christmas break and research it, they're going to force you to return it either before Christmas or like weeks after Christmas just because they can't keep up with the demand. So now, now that you know how to research, <laughs> some of the core research ideas. So this is based, so I say difficulty based on my experience, because I told you before, not a developer, uh, but I'm very strong at networking, because I started doing networking. Dial-up tech support, yeah. So just if, if you don't have a lot of knowledge on how to research something or how to develop your own tools, it's very easy to learn how to use Wireshark. A little bit of a steeper learning curve for TCP dump or some of the other packet capture tools. But if you plug in a device, start sniffing the traffic, you can reconstruct the communication session. And you have a better knowledge of how this device is communicating with the internet. Uh, or the end cloud provider or hosting provider. And I would advise you to plug something in, sniff the traffic, and then configure it to see what changes. See what advertising sites it calls home to, um, like, was it Hockey App and a whole bunch of other statistical information. Uh, does anyone here have a Samsung Smart TV at home? Is it connected to the internet? Probably, yeah. So if you looked at the traffic, that's some research that we did when I was at OpenDNS, is um, it calls home to Korea using a piece of software that is no longer supported and shouldn't be in the product anymore. But it's okay, it's, South, it's the good Korea, so everyone can relax. But it's analytics that, you know, the, these Samsung smart TVs get put in offices all the time. You know, you don't have overhead projectors anymore. You have TVs that some idiot's gonna say, hey, this thing can connect to the internet. We should connect this to the internet. I digress. Software. If you can download the software, associated software with the toy, with 
whatever, maybe it's a standalone application, you just want to reverse it and pick it apart, uh, you should also think about the UI UX, back-end software that's required, the communication channels from maybe it's running a SQL database or um, what's the small SQL database? Thank you, SQLite database. A lot of tools use that. A lot of mobile devices will write to a SQL database on the phone. Uh, so if you're installing apps, you're going to want to include that in your research. There's scope. The platform itself, if you want to do research on the operating system or the cloud provider that it is running on, that's another area of research. I split out the hardware and the circuitry, and I differentiate them in this way. You can research the hardware without really knowing how it was architected using schematics. So the difference is hardware, you can say, okay, it has USB ports. That's cool. It's, you know, I don't know where the UART is. I don't know where any of this stuff is, but I know what this thing looks like when I rip it apart. You can document accordingly. Uh, you can start for the circuitry, so from the hardware side, if you can look at serial numbers of various devices and components, Google them. It's probably all coming from the same warehouse or distributor somewhere in China or Southeast Asia somewhere that you've got a lot number and a bin number and you can say, okay, this is what this is used for. Now the circuitry, is anyone here taking electrical engineering courses or like they were, they were fun. You know, you can do a lot if you understand Let's say you find a kid's toy that has a resistor that isn't sufficient for what's going through it. Maybe this thing catches on fire. Maybe that's some research that the vendor should know about before they release it to the general public or the general public should know about before buying it for their kid so that it doesn't burn their faces off. Or, or not, you know, your call. So these are some of the questions you know, from a network level. Where does it call out to? Is the data encrypted? Uh, software, does it have any flaws, tamper protection? Is plain text data available? Usually it is. The platform, you know, is it hosted in a way that I can circumvent how it communicates or how it operates based on the actual endpoint? Uh, hardware, is it usable information if I direct connect to some of the I.O.? And then circuitry, you know, known or unknown issues with specific components. That's another cool thing is if you find something that has a, uh, a recall because of a problem, that's, you know, that's a shortcut to publish research right there. It's like, hey, these devices which are now sold in bulk to this particular manufacturer and is included in this line of devices that they're aiming at children these could cause physical harm. We should do something about that. I often think, and this is just arbitrary in my mind, uh, that a research team ideally should be made up of three people. It can be more, it can be less, but I find that it's usually easier with three. Specifically with these areas of expertise. Hardware expertise, network expertise and software expertise. Usually what happens when you're doing research though, is you may have someone that spans hardware network expertise and someone just software. Or even more common, uh, you're researching something on your own and no one has hardware expertise or no one has software expertise. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't research. That just means that you don't have to ask questions or pose a hypothesis as it relates to an area that you don't understand. And a great example is if you make do with what you have, this allows someone else to pick up the slack. So if you ask your friends, colleagues, the internet, someone want to help me with this research, nobody jumps on and helps you, you just document in your research that, you know, I am only going to research uh, the network and software capabilities of a particular device or of a product suite, not the hardware. And it lets someone else pick it up down the road. And you can invite people, say, here's the data I have thus far. I haven't looked at the hardware because I don't have that knowledge. If you want to do that, 
you can run your own research, you can help me contribute to mine, or we can release something together. It's great. Now these are just some very quick ideas of the types of um, labs that you can set up. And these are things that, you know, don't think that when I was at OpenDNS I had this huge lab. A lot of these were like stitched together on a ping pong table. That was my, my lab workstation. So if you're looking at software, you probably want to look at the security of the site you're downloading from. Is that susceptible? Can someone poison that site and re replace it with a new executable that is required to download? Is there firmware for a particular device that you should analyze? You should analyze the device itself if it's an IoT device. You should look at the mobile app device. If there's a mobile component, you can look at the platform that it's running on, the mobile, uh, the firmware of the device, and then you're probably going to have an analysis station where you're taking all of your data and centrally analyzing it and aggregating and doing your research. And for God's sakes, back it up. Networking, this is typically what I do is I set up an external router, uh, an internal router, and then in the middle, you know how hard it is to find a 10100 hub brand new right now? It's really hard because everything's a smart desktop switch now. So if you don't have a hub and, you know, looking at the age of some people in this room, I would assume that there's at least one hub sitting in a box somewhere in the basement. Uh, get a a switch with the ability to have a span or a mirror port so you can watch the traffic or get a network tap. Uh, I will warn you though that if you don't get a regenerative network tap, you're only going to see one side of the communication. So you may see internal only or external only. Regenerative tap, you can see both ways. But really it's cheaper just to get a, a switch that has a span port. And Start taking your PCAPs, your logs, your header information, and store that offline because that's part of the network knowledge that you really want to bring in to your research. Um, yeah, this is... <laughs> so, wait a minute, that was networking? That was networking. That's an extra slide. Uh, always think about bidirectional communication, not only what you're sending to it, but what it's sending back to you. Uh, and also look at the cloud hosting infrastructure. So you will notice any device or software may phone home to multiple places. You want to note that in your research because it could be that one of those hosting infrastructures or platforms is the weak link in the chain that could be exploited. Or calling home to South Korea. Software, so again, you're probably going to have an analysis station you can look at the code for the UI, API, open vulnerable ports, you name it, um, and the cloud infrastructure itself, the UI, the API, any ports that may be open or services that are running on that cloud provider that could introduce additional security vulnerabilities or methods to tamper. Hardware, again, this is an area not my personal expertise, did take a whole bunch of electronics in school, but again, I was much better at foosball. Uh, but keep in mind the device firmware, the mobile app device firmware or operating system, and then the inner workings of each. Very important if you want to go the hardware route. And here is just some suggested lab equipment. Uh, you don't have to take a picture of this, I'm going to be publishing the slides. Uh, but if you look here from the hardware side, I've got a link here for, um, this is Mudge's list of tools for hardware hacking from 2014 at Black Hat. Great set of slides, tells you, you know, what type of oscilloscope, uh, what other hardware you might need in order to perform hardware hacking or hardware research. Great resource. Oh, and also from the software side of things, safe assumption that software companies probably have run at least a battery of fuzzing tests against their software. It won't be extensive, so if you've got the time and there's no time constraints, start fuzzing the crap out of the application or 
the, uh, the device because you may find something very interesting that they missed because of their own time constraints of getting stuff to market. This is probably one of the biggest questions that most people don't know they need to answer. Uh, any academics in the audience? So what, so tenure, how awesome is tenure? It's, yeah. If you had tenure, how awesome would tenure be? <laughs> yeah, I hear, yeah, I hear great things. So at, at OpenDNS, uh, we had people that came from academia. And when you ask them when research would be completed or when do you think this will be, you know, this subsection will be done, the answer was generally when it's done. You have to realize that uh, in most companies, if you're doing research for that company, you don't have that ability just to say it'll be done when it's done. There are artificial time constraints, which we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, that are imposed upon you that you have no control over. So you have to set your expectations and your research agenda accordingly. So these are four areas that I've defined that I communicated to people that this is when you can stop or when you know it's time to stop. So the time constraint, so it, there are sometimes marketing constraints. So at OpenDNS, we had a blog cadence where everyone on the team would rotate through. At first, it was everyone does one blog post a month. As we grew the team, it, you know, it was once every month and a half. But if you wanted to talk about something that someone, like a fellow researcher, cared about, there would be some research. So you wouldn't do a grand one-year research project. You would do a very short research project to support the publication. And that's not saying it would it have been more valuable to do a year long, maybe. But is there immediate value to the company that is paying you in doing a short one to drive people to get other researchers excited in what you're doing? Yeah, I'd say there's definitely value in that. Diminished relevancy. Maybe what you are researching gets researched by someone else and they publish their findings ahead of yours. And you read through their findings and you realize, oh, they covered absolutely everything I was going to cover. Crap. Should I keep researching? Well, probably not. Uh, unless you can find a marked difference between the way they research something or, or your hypothesis was different. Researching after someone has researched it and published your expected conclusions is kind of a waste of time. Uh, I would move on to something else. That's my advice. So also success and failure. Success, yay, everything's great. I can publish my research. Failure, uh, I've disproved, disproved my hypothesis. So does anyone know, is failure in research a bad thing? Why? Why is failure not a bad thing? I have prizes. You learn something. You do learn something. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> there you go. Sure. And that. My back's sore. This is as far as I'm going to walk. So. Failure, so success, I'll talk about success a little bit first here. So it's a crucial part of the research project. It's great. And you know that you have hit success, you've hit pay dirt, if you've created new knowledge that was not out there before. Uh, someone has made a decision or a policy or something has happened as a direct result of your published research. A report, presentation, whatever, infographic, you know how I feel about infographics. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you can mark success by saying, I don't have the data I needed to really get my question answered. That's successful. You know, you, you came up with some solutions. It may have created new knowledge that you didn't have before, but you can always go back and edit that later or rerun it. So in terms of failure, not everything is successful, no matter what your mother told you. Uh, but never look at it as failure. A negative outcome just means that you either didn't ask the right question or that 
your hypothesis was flawed in some way. So by saying that, you know, I believe that uh, clear text communication occurred between Barbie and a particular cloud provider, if I went through with that entire hypothesis and I came to the end and said, nope, uses SSL, huh, well, so that's, that's a negative, that's a failed research project, but now I know. So I have created new knowledge for myself that I can then in turn rerun through the research loop. So some of the negative outcomes, uh, someone will make decisions that disregard evidence. Uh, you can probably look at any Fox News pie chart. Uh, equivocal results that don't shed light in one direction or the other, so you just, you can't come to a final conclusion. You know, it's just huge gray area. Uh, uncertainty prevents new knowledge, so you're not sure, you don't want to go out on a limb and say, you know, conclusively, I have found that this is the results, maybe, I think. You know, no one's going to really believe you or trust you. Now, presenting your research. This is a pipeline model that uh, I liberated from Roger Peng at, oh, what school is he at? I always forget this. Um, Johns Hopkins. He's at Johns Hopkins. So this is the way he thinks of the research pipeline. So you have the data, you've created code, you've got the analytical data, you have some analytics code, and you have the results. Now I need to present it in some way, shape, or form. So now what we're going to talk about is this part, the presentation side of things, which will make you famous or infamous. So some of the ways that you can publish research. And don't think that everything has to be an academic paper. A lot of academics that come out of school, they've had it drilled into them through their master's or their PhD program that everything has to be a long, boring paper with all of the facts and figures. Sometimes it can be just a short blog post with, you know, more information to be released at a later time. So blogs, very effective way. A lot of bang for the buck. A lot of people see those. Articles, if you're publishing your findings in a journal of your peers, uh, you're, you're getting exclusive access to peers who can validate your findings and recreate your findings, but you're really limiting the scope. So, you know, the, sorry, that was for papers. So articles, when I talk about articles, I'm thinking of trade publications like Dark Reading or some of the other um, trade pubs out there that will publish a lengthy article based on someone's research. You can get a lot of face time and publication value by giving a, a reporter an exclusive on your research. They eat that up because they want to be the first to release something. Uh, don't send it to Krebs because he gets these all the time. He's not going to have the time to send it to you or to, to dedicate to take your research and publish it. So find some of the lesser known or maybe not some of the top tier reporters. Go to them and say, hey, I'll give you an exclusive on this if you want to cover it. Mention me prominently. They'll be like, oh yeah, yeah, I'll totally do that. So academic paper, again, I'm not an academic. There is, there's a lot of outlets. Uh, the challenge I see with academic papers is generally if it's not part of the peer community that has access to this information already, someone would have to pay to get access. And that, for me, that's a deterrent. Although there is a site in Russia that publishes everyone's research papers, and I always forget the name of it. Um, but you didn't hear that from me. Of course, now it's on the internet, so. Uh, white papers, you know, very effective marketing tool to take your information and distill it so that executives or the targeted purchaser of your product, service, uh, information can consume it and digest it in a manner that they're used to. I'm gonna skip that. Again, I'm not an academic. So visualizations. I'm a very visual person. Uh, I love data visualizations. I'm not very good at making them, but there's a lot of tools out there that can do it for you. So if you've never looked at RAW, if you like D3 visualizations, RAW is awesome because you can just upload a spreadsheet or a CSV, TSV file, and then do a lot of the uh, data visualizations that you would probably have to go out of your way to make in D3. 
they have a lot of things that are above and beyond like pie charts. So there's alluvial diagrams and heat maps and really great things. You can download it and include it in your reports. Uh, Tableau Public is free and it also gives you a way to publish your data very easily with a couple of clicks and you can send people to your, your data. Open Graffiti, so that's something that we built at OpenDNS, which is a 3D, how do I explain it? It's a three-dimensional immersive network, uh, semantic network graph that you can actually hook up to Oculus Rift and uh, the Leap Motion. So now everyone can go back and justify an expense for a Leap Motion and a... Um, Oculus Rift for research purposes. But yeah, you can fly through your data and grab nodes and edges and everything. It's really cool. Uh, graphics, so pictures. Don't put pictures just for the sake of pictures. Make sure they mean something. Infographics, they're good for big picture items. Um, I've dealt with marketing people whether every time I went to them with research or a story or anything, they're like, oh, we can make a great infographic out of that. I'm like, How about we make something more substantial? than an infographic that everyone's going to say, yep, that's an infographic. Next. Reporters hate infographics too, by the way. Conference talks. Ta-da. You can present a lot of your knowledge. Um, it's stressful for some. The advice, if, does anyone here not like talking in public? Only two people. Wow, that's, that's impressive. Does anyone here not like raising their hands to questions from a podium? Yeah, double that. So it's very stressful. The, the advice I can give to you, and this is what I always gave to my guys, is people are coming to see you talk. If you present it, or if you think about it as edutainment, it takes a lot of the shock out of it, and it takes a lot of the pressure off of you. You can imagine people naked if you want. In the security community, though, you probably don't want to imagine too many of us naked. That's a lot of pasty whiteness that you don't want to see. You can't unsee that. But if you're presenting and you have data to back up your research, always point to the data. Press interviews, you know, you need to really up-level it and make sure that they can understand what you're communicating. Uh, another tip that if you're dealing with press, if you write for them what you want to be written, it's so much easier for them to copy and paste that... Uh, you become an asset to them very quickly because you've done a lot of the work for them. And always remember sound bites and charts. That's what reporters want. They want sound bites, they want quips, and they want charts because they want to beef up their stories without having to think too hard about it. If you're going to present your code, which I strongly encourage, Python R Ruby, use whatever you want, it's your code. Uh, pick a language that other people use. So don't use COBOL. Don't use Fortran. God, don't use Fortran. Uh, Jupyter Notebook. If you want to present visual step-by-step -step executions of your information, by all means, use Jupyter Notebook. It's great. And you can release the notebook so someone can go through step-by-step -step and recreate your, uh, your research. GitHub. Please upload your code somewhere. I don't care if you public, publicly put it on GitHub or if you put it in a private repo. At some point, you're going to want that code. So put it somewhere. If you publish code publicly, if you're allowed to publish your code, it allows other people to look at your research and potentially recreate it. If you can publish your data, even better. Because if an argument comes up and say, oh, you know, your research is crap, you didn't do all this. I'm like, I did do that. Here's my code and here's the data. Please, you know, prove me wrong. Usually the, uh, the peanut gallery on Twitter will back off at that point. Because like, oh, crap, now I have to do work. Uh, I'll move on and yell at someone else and tell them they're stupid. So this is a great quote that I, I found one time. It said, when you write code, keep in mind that you're collaborating with your future self. Has anyone ever gone back and looked at their code and thought, what the hell was I thinking? Now, who wrote this? What, what kind of idiot wrote? Oh, I, oh, that was me. Huh. Everything should have go-tos, in my opinion. So, I know we're running out of time here, but defending your research is very important, and there are very good ways to do it. There are also very bad ways to do it. 
Um, so you will find your findings will be challenged at some point. That's not a bad thing. That means people care. If no one challenges your research, it probably wasn't that relevant in the first place. And it's probably arrogant to think that every piece of research you publish is absolutely pristine and perfect, uh, because it probably isn't. So your challengers, you will have shit disturbers, shit heads, uh, grandstanders who just want to, you know, see the world burn. They may be friends, colleagues, peers. Uh, they could challenge it. So you have to defend accordingly. So always argue with your data and your findings. This is why you publish your research and you present it in a way that's consumable. Uh, if you can publish your code, great. If you can publish the data along with that code, even better. So someone can go and reproduce it or try and disprove your findings. And uh, just ask them for alternative findings based on what you've given them. If they come up with something else, that's great. That's not bad news. That just means that you can do some research more. And you may have found a friend or a frenemy that you can help you research stuff. And some people will just challenge your research because they're jealous of what you do. How many people do you think were pissed off when the car hacking research by Chris and uh, Chris and Charlie Miller? Damn it! Yeah, I'm sure there were a lot of people that were upset. Not just the vendors, but other people that were dedicating a whole bunch of time to researching that kind of stuff, and they may have lashed out inappropriately to say, you know, this is stupid, why would you do this, uh, you did it wrong, you didn't take the time to do this, this, and this, and they're just jealous. They, they want, some people just want to see the world burn, and that happens. Don't take it personal. Uh, I'll skip that. So responsible disclosure, please disclose responsibly. Responsibly doesn't mean holding a vendor ransom or hostage, that's called extortion. Uh, you could get a very negative response from a vendor. So when we disclosed our stuff to Toy Talk, who did the software for the Hello Barbie interaction, they were really open. Uh, I got on, we got on the phone with the CTO, he had his team there, and they would have constant update calls with us to tell us how things were progressing with the fixes, uh, that we had reported. And they kept asking us, you know, when do you need to publish your research by? Not, don't publish your research until we have it fixed. Tell us when you need to have this published so we can prioritize how fast we fix this thing. I thought that was great. Not only that, but they decided to give us 10 grand towards our research as a bug bounty. There wasn't a bug bounty program at the time. They were starting one the day after we reported it. We didn't know that. And they're like, you know what? These are significant findings. We'll give you guys 10 grand. Like, cool. So I let Andrew take it all because I'm Canadian. I didn't want the tax headache. But yeah, they gave him 10 grand. That's pretty cool. So just to summarize a little bit here, I hope that by looking at this, you realize that anyone can research something, absolutely something, anything. Uh, just make sure that you have a repeatable process that you can follow, and that if someone challenges you, you can point to the process, you can point to the analytics, you can point to the data, you can point to the code. That makes defending your research that much easier and disclose responsibly and understand that people are going to hate you at some point in your life. Just get past it. Uh, sometimes people, like I said, they just want to see the world burn. So some further reading. If you want to get into the data science side of things, I strong, I can't recommend enough the executive data science and the data science courses at Coursera. Uh, Fantastic. Get you thinking, even if you don't know R, so this is all done in R, but it's directly transferable over to pandas and Python. All the information, very easy to pick up. Uh, if you don't want to sign up for the course, this link here is all of the course materials. But you do get a lot from hearing, oh, hearing them present. I'm going to sue. Code Academy, if you like if you want to learn a new language, go there, awesome. These are a whole bunch of books that I actually own. Uh, if you're doing any sort of network inspection or traffic analysis, this should be on your bookshelf. 
This will help you not try and memorize offsets and different header information and packets that you don't care about until the time that you're trying to do the research. I've had that book on my shelf for years, and it is just as valid then as it is now. Uh, yeah, data-driven security, shout out to uh, Jay and Not-So-Silent Bob. They wrote a great book on how to visualize data and present your findings. Uh, so yeah, data-driven security blog, Bob's blog, my blog, I post a lot of stuff up there, and OpenDNS Security Labs, they have a lot of great blogs uh, on presenting data and just how they take their findings and their research and communicate it to the world. So with that, does anyone have any questions? I have two more pairs of socks. No questions? Does anyone... Uh, Actually, question, has anyone gone to a conference and sat back and thought, you know, I should really research something, but I don't know where to get started, or, yeah. Do you know now? <laughs> yeah, a little bit more? Cool. Well, those are the two sock winners right there. There you go. Or you're just trying to not admit that you love watching it, too. So think think of your and uh, man, this guy's got a lot of slides. So what's your what's your specialty right now? Yes. Yeah. You going crazy back there? Yeah, all right. Um, so ask yourself, so what's the question you're trying to answer? How much spam am I, or why am I getting so much spam? It, it's really loose, so you need to really tighten that up. So pose a question or find a question. So I'm launching a website that's called researchsomething.com, and I'm going to start putting things up there like, you know, here's a research topic. Someone go and do something. Uh, but you, you need to figure out a tight question with constraints that allow you to focus on just a small piece. IoT devices, it's great if you just want to do network side or if you just want to do software side, it's, or if you want to build tools, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways you can go. Haha! <laughs> start a blog. Honestly, if you want to get better at writing, start a blog. You may not think that you have anything to contribute or to share, but guaranteed you will publish something that not only will you reference in like two to three years, but someone else will reference. I still have a blog post that gets hit all the time on how to manually configure interfaces on Ubuntu. You know, that should be common knowledge now, but yeah, people still reference that when they're searching for how the hell do I do this? You know, that type of information should be out there and, you know, why not be the person to do it? So I'm getting kicked off here. Um, if you want to get a hold of me, find me on Twitter, just Andrew S.M. Hay, uh, or send me an email, and these slides will be available. So, yeah.